sabrosura pa ti que que. Hello everyone, this is Pam, the Cafe con Pam, the bilingual podcast that features Latine and people of the global majority who break barriers, change lives, and make the world a better place. Welcome to episode 350 of Cafe con Pam. Today, we have a conversation with Isabel Gonzalez Whitaker. Isabel is the Associate Vice President for Public Engagement for Moms Clean Air Force and the Director of Ecomadres. Isabel was the Chief Operating Officer of All In Together, a leading nonprofit dedicated to advancing women's leadership through civic participation. Previously, she was Principal Advisor, Executive Strategic Communications for ALSAC, the $2 billion plus annual fundraising and awareness organization for St. Jude Children's Hospital, which is headquartered in Memphis. Isabel was also the deputy editor of Billboard and features editor at InStyle and wrote for Time, the New York Times, the Hollywood Reporter, the Washington Post, Harper's Bazaar, and Refinery29. Isabel también was the scholar in residence at Rhodes College 2018 to 2019 and is currently a co-generate senior fellow and in 2023 gave a TEDx Atlanta talk on the power of civic engagement to improve community and sustain democracy. She's also the co-author of the cookbook Latin Cheek. Oh, ¿Cómo se dice? Latin chic. Entertaining with Style and Sass by Harper Collins and executive producer of the documentary short Women in Music, Inspiring a Generation, featuring former First Lady Michelle Obama. In 2019, she co-edited the anthology and contributed the essay Finding La Reina in Queen Bay to Queen Bay a celebration of the power and creativity of Beyonce Knowles Carter. <laughs> Listeners, as you know, as you may have already heard, Isabel is incredible. This is one of those conversations that needed like seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I really enjoyed talking to Isabel and exploring the many intricacies of her career and her life. And civic engagement is something that's really important that I think you will take away from this conversation and is how could you put your granito de arena in your community, in the city that you live in, in the space that you call home, in the land, because we all have an element of power. And so I'm not going to talk more about it. I'll let you listen to my conversation with Isabel Gonzalez. Isabel, thank you for coming to Cafe Con Pam. Welcome. Thank you so much. Gracias. Yes. How are you? Where are you tuning in from? I'm tuning in from Memphis, Tennessee. So I've I've lived in Memphis now for a little bit over five years, and I love it. It's such a cool town. If you haven't been, let me be your tour guide. Great food, great music, amazing history. Amazing history, indeed. I was in Memphis last year, end of last year. I went to visit St. Jude, actually. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I got an invite. Uh, as you probably know, I worked there for about three years, and uh, it was my first nonprofit job, and um, and it was uh, so incredibly eye-opening in the most positive way. For sure. Yeah, we'll probably touch in a little bit about how you transitioned, because you went from a very different industry. Yes, completely. <laughs> yes. So the first question, even though this is not the first question anymore, but the question that we always ask is, what is your heritage? I'm Cuban. So both my parents were born in Cuba um, and my brother and sister were born in Cuba. I'm the first born in the United States. Wow. Mm -hmm. And your mom, I know your mom left a long time ago with your brother and your sister. Correct. So she essentially fled the revolution. They were death threats against her family. And, um, you know, she had to sort of flee in the middle of the night with two young kids, landed in Key West, didn't speak the language, um, 
And like many Cubans at the time that were uh, sort of living through this very tumultuous moment on the island, she thought she was going to go back, you know, in a few months. So they had a suitcase and that was about it and never went back. Wow. But they didn't stay. She didn't stay in in Florida. No, she didn't. Um, At that time, she was married to a man who was also Cuban who had preceded her um, and they located to New York. And it was the first time my sister still talks about her first memories of snow <laughs> being in Central Park. Oh my God. Yeah. I like the culture shock of, of just the snow really imprinting on her. So yeah, so there was, uh, our family has always been on the East Coast. Um, so from New York uh, back to Atlanta, uh, eventually I was born in North Carolina, but basically grew up in Atlanta. How did you land it? Like, how did they, from New York, go to Atlanta? Um, my father was an academic. And so he was um, at Georgia Tech for many years and then later did research with Emory University. And so Atlanta just happened to be sort of where they, they landed and decided to, um, you know, skip skip the, the usual uh, disembarkment of Miami, where we also had a lot of family. Um, and I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, which at the time was, you know, very, uh, not, uh, as populated as it is now with Latinos. For sure. And my parents opened, I think at that time it might've been, it was either the first or the second Cuban restaurant ever (laughs) in Georgia. Um, and it was a small Cuban sandwich shop and I, and I washed dishes in the kitchen and my brother and sister, uh, waited tables and my dad was the cook and my mom was the hostess. And he was still an academic? Like, was that kind of like a side thing? It was like a side thing. And then eventually he left academia for a period just to do the restaurant and to, it was a dream of my mother's. Um, she loved to cook. And, uh, you know, my mother did not go to college, but she had an incredible sense for marketing and for sharing, frankly, our culture with a wider audience. And so this really gave her the opportunity to learn um, how to create business and, and, you know, ultimately the restaurant failed. I mean, it took all their savings. It took uh, a lot of their spirit with it. Um, But they learned so much. My father then went back to academia and my mother then became an advocate for Latinos in in Georgia. Uh, She believed everybody had a right to um, have a shot at the American dream and to have economic success and to have better tools and access to resources to not be taken advantage of. Um, And she took all those hard, hard earned lessons of seven, eight years in business that were very difficult, not knowing anything and, um, and eventually uh, grew and established the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in in Atlanta with satellite offices all over the state and business incubators. So, you know, she really took a, what could have been a real negative, found the silver lining. And as she used to say, you know, make mojitos from her, from her lemons. (laughs) You make mojitos with mint, but you know, you can add some lemons in there too. (laughs) Right, right. Do you, how old were you when this happened? Do you remember witnessing the, the shift of like, we're deciding to close the restaurant? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, uh, you know, this would probably be between the ages of, I want to say five and 12, you know, so I witnessed firsthand, you know, the ups and downs of entrepreneurialism in this country uh, from the perspective of people that were very ill-equipped to navigate those waters, mm. even though, you know, my father was very well educated. Uh, it's one thing to be uh, book smart and another thing to be business savvy and uh, and and to be H- Hispanic, right? And to have an accent right. um, and and to try to, you know, it's so nice that we live in a country where there are resources available to us in a way that they weren't always available to everybody equitably. Um, And I think my parents, uh, you know, were a cautionary tale uh, to many other immigrants who, you know, invested their life savings in something that ultimately, you know, drained them Mm. 
emotionally and financially. And yeah, I, I bore witness to that. But what was beautiful, and maybe that's what makes me courageous in my own career pivots, is that my mother took that opportunity and said, well, this isn't right. This isn't fair. And she was always a, a warrior and always fighting for justice and knew that um, she didn't want this to happen to other people. I love that. And so she went into becoming, growing the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which is really cool. How did you decide to grow into your career? (laughs) Oh, gosh. Um, Because you witnessed the the thing of the restaurant, like, you know, being a business owner probably was like, well, I'm not going to. And I'm very not entrepreneurial as a result. (laughs) It's so funny because my sister and brother both became entrepreneurs and found success in their own rights. And I was like, this is scary. Can't do it. Like give it Walk up, away. give it up to everybody who does it. I'm like, whoo, that was stressful. So that definitely left an imprint in my psyche. Um, I, you know, but look, I learned the value of hard work and, and I've never been scared to roll up my sleeves and work really, really hard. Um, and and so I was a really good student and, um, and I, uh, you know, got a scholarship to college and didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, but I sort of got like a, a, a general mass comm degree, knew that I, I wanted to do something either in television or pop culture and, and sort of stumbled my way into journalism and, uh, and got some, some nice breaks, but also, you know, applied myself and tried really, really hard to do a good job and to learn on the job. And so I started writing around Atlanta. I moved back home with my parents um, and my grandmother, which was awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, my American friends didn't really know, didn't quite understand that concept. Multi-generational household. And all I can say now is that I was pioneering that concept of moving back home with your parents. (laughs) And I would do it again and again. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, and just worked really hard and then realized that, uh, if I was going to really take media seriously, that I, I wanted to be in a bigger market. And so sort of made my way to New York, um, where I had a very nice, uh, and long career in magazines, uh, magazines, which basically, uh, are sort of, uh, a, a, a much diminished, um, uh, version of what they used to be. Magazines used to yeah. be everywhere and the size of, well, I was going to say uh, the yellow pages, but people may not know what the yellow pages are, but, <laughs> but really, really big and thick. And then, um, and then, uh, and then things started to pivot to digital and I, and I had some experience in, in digital media as well, but, um, uh, Pre-COVID, had the opportunity to move to Memphis because my husband works for the NBA, and uh, and decided it was time to. We don't have family in New York, and we are from the South, so I wanted to come home. So we're going to backtrack a little because there's a lot of context in there that <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> sure. So you finish college, and you're like, is there something that's like we're going to go into into media? Like what what planted? The I want to be something related to pop culture, like because your dad's an academic, your mom's an advocate. You know, like how did we get there? Yeah, I mean, and so my mom at that time was really uh, her her she was forging her own path of advocacy, right, and activism. And I had done a little bit of uh, that rubs off, like in your family, right? Like I had Mm -hmm. I, I had witnessed her and. Uh, not only the struggles and sacrifices of her life, but how she's how she had stood up for other people and specifically her children, um, and faced some real hardships. And and so I had absorbed some of that energy and and had some uh, causes of my own, which were mostly environmentally rooted. Um, but but was also really informed by the beauty and richness and art and creativity of our culture. Um, I don't know about you, but I grew up with lots of um, Ola magazines, a lot of uh, Vanidades, uh, Imagen magazine, and uh, a value placed on 
uh, presentation and um, an aesthetic. And um, and so fashion was something I was always really interested in. Um, things, you know, home decor, you know, beautiful things, colorful things. Mm -hmm. And even though we didn't have that much growing up, you know, my mother always made an effort, right? The way she presented herself. The It's a very Latina thing. Yeah. And, you know, and our house was always, you knew you were walking into a Latino house. It was like the most <laughs> yeah. colorful house on the block, you know, <laughs> and, uh, or probably, it probably smelled like food all the time. Right. And so, you know, there was a, a richness to life that I, that I was drawn to. So I can't say that I was necessarily like, I, I knew I was never going to go work for uh, Entertainment Weekly or, but I, there was, I, I wanted to be near an epicenter of creative culture. And, um, and that's sort of what took me in that direction. And going back to the ac academic part. Yeah. I mean, I think my father was for many years, uh, I don't want to use the word disappointed, but I certainly felt like I was disappointing him by not being a lawyer, doctor, engineer. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and we all have sort of those, conflicts and conversations. And uh, I think he's very proud of me now, me now, because ultimately, I worked hard at something that, that I wanted to work hard toward. And that made me happy. And working in magazines in New York for 20 years in the 2000s was a lot of fun, very rewarding. Um, and it was, it was really neat to be part of the cultural conversations that were happening then and reporting on them. For sure. How does Isabel Gonzalez walk into New York mm -hmm. in this world of probably not many Gonzalez? How do you overcome that if there's any to, anything to overcome? Well, at the time, it looked really different than it does now in, in the halls of, uh, of journalism. I mean, still, the numbers are too low. Uh, but really, I mean, I think at one point I was like the highest ranking Latina in all of timing ever. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's shameful, you know, like that's, you don't want to, you know, it shouldn't be that way. So, um, but I always was extraordinarily proud of who I was. And I actually, you know, and, and you see sort of this, um, and talking to you, I'm reminded of it, like this conversation is inspire, you know, informing me, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a through line for my own advocacy, like, I started with my best friend at Time Inc. because she was Latina, the first ever Hispanic affinity group. And, you know, here, oh. here we were, the little Miss, you know, Latina Norma Rays of Time Inc. going, you know, we're here, we have a, we have a say, you need more people that look like us at these, uh, at these magazines. And, and I remember I got a, an award for diversity for that. So, you know, and a lot of that was happening, you know, in the early 2000s, when this was, there were no DEI, DEIJ right. departments, there was no, you know, corporate social responsibility was, you know, just a, a germ of an idea at that time. So um, I, I wore my name and my history proudly. And, and, And I took sort of the advocacy that my mother was deploying in Atlanta around, um, I'd say, economic empowerment for Latino communities uh, and helping Latino communities in Georgia to those halls and, and just never shirked away or shied away from my identity and wanted to uplift others and wanted to make sure we were using writers of color and putting people with my last name, similar last names in the magazines that I worked for. So um, it's a great question that you asked me because, you know, now I sort of see like a, a current or a through line mm -hmm. of activism um, that even while I was writing about shoes and makeup, <laughs> right. I was like, you know, let's get a Latina writer on this. Yes, for sure. You interview, I mean, you've, you've, done a lot of features for like really awesome people did you ever feel like omg i'm like <laughs> talking to i mean i could name all the names yeah <laughs> um well my my funny beyonce story i've interviewed her i've had the privilege and honor of interviewing her twice and she is as amazing as um 
the myth that she is. Um, <laughs> you know, here's the thing about celebrities. You know, their their job is to win you over. So, mm-hmm. um, and they're really good at. It. I mean, they're they are in the in the public face because they are charismatic, because they are so likable, because they are magnetic. And I remember going home to my husband after I think my first or second fiance cover story interview and saying, okay, don't be surprised. Um, Her best friend from Texas is Cuban and we really hit it off and she loves Cuban food. (laughs) We're besties. (laughs) If she and Jay call us for dinner, you know, we're going to go to Victor's and it's going to be so great. Of course she never called, but you know, and he was like, (laughs) my husband who was a sports journalist at the time was like, yeah, you know, that's like, that's their job. And I was like, no, 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 no. We're like, look, best friends. <laughs> um, and I still love her to this day. No, I mean, look, I, I've been really lucky to be able to have incredible conversations with people that I admire that have done incredible creative output. Um, and it's it's nice to be in a position to be able to, ha- to help them share their magic with as broad an audience as possible. Um, and I don't take that lightly. Like I, 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 I respect them. Anybody that I've talked to and all those names, those people have worked their butts off and are some of the smartest people in the room. Mm -hmm. Those things do not happen by accident, especially for the women of color. Mm -hmm, For sure. So you are in the, in media in your career, you you're climbing up the ladder and is it that your mom passed that kind of like trigger this, like, what am I doing? I need to shift. Is that when it happened? Yeah. To- a thousand percent. I thought it was as simple as that. It was crazy. Crazy. I remember going to her memorial, having sort of a, a clear sense of like, okay, my mom, my mom does good stuff for people, right? Like my mom stands up for people. My mom uh, raises money for people. My mom uh, puts her neck out there for people. Um, but I don't think I really understood that. I mean, I was in my own world trying to, you know, forge my own path and, you know, and she was doing her own thing and, and, uh, and I was super proud of her. Was it unexpected? Yeah. I was at her memorial and, uh, the church was packed and people were coming up to me saying how much she had touched their lives and how much she had helped them and what an angel she was. And these were strangers to me and telling me this in Spanish. And, um, and look, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say that I wasn't already nearing this sort of decision. I think that I had already had in me some, what do I do here? Like, am I going to write about Mm. celebrities and fashion forever? Like what, what do I want? Like, this was a lot of fun. And this was, you know, there were, there were moments of, of real gravitas and importance in, in that sort of output. But what else? Like there, I knew there was something and I didn't know what that something was. And that was a defining moment because at that point I said, you know, as a, as an immigrant, I've worked so hard and, you know, one that has been proximate to poverty. I've worked so hard toward this definition of success that included the right bags, the right shoes, the right restaurants, the right zip code. Um, And I looked at my mother's definition of success and it was about how do I make somebody's life better? How do I make sure that they don't suffer the way I suffered? How do you protect women and children from predators? And that, you know, I mean, that large, you know, that can be, that can be systems, that can be people. Um, And I was just like, okay, my definition of success has changed, you know, and I had always, always wanted to have a corner office, I always wanted to be an editor in chief of a magazine. I got super close and that was like, I don't want that anymore. I want something that has more meaning for me. 
right? That all of that has meaning for somebody else in a certain season, but my mm-hmm. season was over and it was time for me to have meaning and, and to find success in a different way. And um, yeah, and that's, and that's where I, the, the idea of the park happened in that moment. It's really powerful because sometimes, I mean, at this point, you're some years into your career and there's some expectations. You are known in the industry, you know, you're building your name. Was there ever a moment like a sunk cost fallacy moment where it's like, oh, I've invested all this time in my career. Like, am I really going to just like step away? Was there ever that thought or were you like, no? No, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a side hustle chick, right? Like, no, there's no stepping away. There's always having a safety net. Like I said, I'm not the entrepreneur in the family. I'm like such a like low risk, like not comfortable in taking big leaps. So I did it really strategically. And and I did it the way I've done other things, which is with a plan with a plan and concurrently. And I also knew because Oprah had said it, (laughs) or somebody had said it, I I always credit Oprah. Um, (laughs) But basically, it was like, if you do something 15 minutes a week, it'll eventually get done. Like if you if you build toward if you take the steps, no matter how small, but you're consistent in your actions, um, you'll build something. And so that was like, I just, I mean, granted, look, I, and I was on the floor depressed, right? Like I could barely move. Like my mom and I were tight, you know, we were a small family. Like for me, that rocked my world. She died pretty, she was on and off sick, but she died pretty suddenly. Um, she died in my arms of a heart attack. You know, it was one of the, it was one of those weird spiritual things where like, I was supposed to be hanging out with a girlfriend in New York. And I said, something's calling me to Atlanta. I got to go. And I went to Atlanta and that was the weekend that she died. And I was with, whoa. Yeah. So like, it wasn't like I was going to be like, okay, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to just start from scratch and figure out something else. No, I was like, totally like, let me just keep breathing give myself grace, you know, keep the steady drumbeat of the job, the security that I needed, the health insurance that I needed. I know this is not my, my long-term vision anymore. Let me see where I go with this and let me build this little thing over here and see where this path takes me. And eventually this path goes away and this path becomes the path. So many lessons that you're giving us of thriving despite the circumstances, because a few months later, even your brother passed. Oh, yeah. And so you're still grieving your mom. Yeah. And then another tragedy happened. Yeah. And then I and then, then I, you moved. Oh, my God. And then I really didn't get off the floor for like two years. Um, yeah, it sucked. There's I used to just say like I was going through like a major existential crisis. I didn't know. Uh you know, I was trying to start a family. I couldn't, I was having miscarriages, you know, like, you know, but we all walk through the valley, right? For sure. Like we all have seasons that are going to be very challenging and very dark. And that was one for me. Um, And, you know, I credit the village of friends who stood by me, you know, the family, that, you know, we have a small family, the family that I had left. Um, My husband was a rock, you know, my therapist, you know, like I said, we live in a time now where, uh, you know, it's acceptable to admit weakness and vulnerability and to lean on the resources and tools that are available to us. And so I did, you know, just to keep going and put one forward. Like my mom used to say, palante, palante, you know, like one foot one step at a time. And, um, but yeah, the, my brother, my brother passing, which was also sort of a very sudden death, um, reinforced in me that definition of success. Life is really short. Life is really precious. Do what you can to make it better for other people. Um, and walk the path that you want to be walking on. And for me, I just knew that um, my time in media in New York was was no longer what was driving me and and that I wanted to do something for community. And I wanted to honor uh, I wanted to honor both of them. I wanted to honor my mother and my brother and my community. 
For sure. Really powerful. So we're going to take a coffee break and we're going to come back to the rest of your story. Okay. Sabrosura, papi, que, que. I'm going to have a sip of my coffee. Yes. Cafecito aquí. Let's, you still have, you're drinking cafecito right now? <laughs> and you're Cuban, so I think all day it's in your, long. Your blood. <laughs> yeah. And it is fully cafe con leche. It is like lots of milk, a little bit of coffee. Nice. So, Isabel, obviously you do drink coffee and you do your daily cafe con leche. But the thing is that Cuban coffee is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like super strong espresso um, with lots and lots of sugar which is delicious like that, but I like having my, my, my super size <laughs> caffeinated uh, moment with lots of milk. <laughs> <laughs> Your caffeinated yeah. milk. I love that. And do you typically brew it at home? I do. I make my coffee at home. It's such a beautiful ritual. I love it. I love ritualistic coffee making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really grounding. I love to smell it. I love, I, yeah, I love the whole process <laughs> and my day. I'm like, if I can't make my coffee, I'm like, oh my God, my day is totally, Different. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Making my coffee in the morning is one of my favorite parts of the day. And I look forward to it. Every time I go to bed, I'm like, oh, I'm so excited to make my morning coffee. Is that you too? <laughs> yes. Can't wait. can't wait to wake up to make my coffee and play Wordle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Do you have a favorite local coffee shop that you would like to shout out? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, there is one called Comeback Coffee that's not far from where we are here um, in downtown Memphis. That's groovy and cool and independent. Um, and they have really good coffees. Usually, though, I will tell you, when I go out to meet people for coffee, I always have a vent, uh, chai latte. Oh, uh -huh. That's my outdoor drink. And then coffee, coffee is my indoor drink. So at home, I'm drinking coffee. Out, out, outside of home, I'm drinking my chai latte. Okay. I love that. On my end, because I am that person, it's 1.30 my time right now. So I'm drinking tea. <laughs> so I'm like, but I've already had my two cups of coffee. And this morning I had mushroom coffee. So I added some various types of mushrooms, lion's mane, cordyceps, reishi, all of them once to help with, with my focus. And it does help a lot. Does it? Okay. Cause I, I got to get back on that because I was doing, I was adding the powder to my coffee for a while. Um, and then I just like ran out and I never did it again, but you've just reminded me. I have ADHD. And so I'm always noticing like, what are the things that distract me? And I mean, my environment is one. And so now shifting some things, putting um, earplugs helps, which is really interesting. That's so interesting. I've heard, I mean, I think I, I'm undiagnosed, but, you know, I, I, I would imagine that I probably tick some of those boxes too, um, that when you listen to music, it tricks your brain. Like if you have ADHD and this is so, this works for me. Like if I'm playing music in the background, I can be more focused on the task at hand. Totally. It's like such a brain hack. It's a super brain hack to listen to music. I listen to lately. I mean, I, I've always said I was born in the wrong era because I listened to like 70s, like blues and jazz, which, Ooh, you know. Love it. <laughs> that's why I like Memphis. And yeah. so I have these, this headphones that are over ear. Ooh. They don't go inside your ear. They're not the ones that I have right now, but they they literally, it's all vibration. And so then I put earplugs. It's like all the things. And that helps a ton. Good. It's like isolate myself from the outside noise, but at the same time, listen to something. But it's vibrating. So it kind of like calms you down. Ooh, it's like ASMR. I love it. Okay, cool. <laughs> and my latest playlist has been pop um, classical without Ooh. words. Pop classical without words. So covers, classical covers. Of pop songs. Of pop songs. Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. No lyrics. Okay. No lyrics. So Bridgerton soundtrack. Uh -huh. Oh. That kind of music. That kind of stuff. Oh, that's cool. What did you think of Usher's performance at the Super Bowl? I mean, it was a great, I think it was a great performance for millennials, which 
maybe we can get into this a little bit for you that you've been in media. I heard, so I'm a marketer mm -hmm. talking to other marketers that the Super Bowl's performer is geared towards who is driving the economy that year. <gasps> oh, that's so interesting. I'd never heard that. Mm -hmm. So are millennials driving the economy? Yes. Huh. This year, 2024 is the year of millennials, like finally okay. owning their power. <laughs> well, then that makes sense. I mean, I just liked it because, you know, ATL, but uh, <laughs> yeah. that's cool. But yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. Oh, I'm going to totally like go on like a Google. Get into a, a nice rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, later. <laughs> Let me know what you find. <laughs> that's so cool. Think about it, like all the, the various Super Bowls, they always bring in a different artist that attracts a different, a specific yeah. demographic. And so we were discussing it in this like group and I'm like, you know what? There's something there that I think is actually right. Oh my gosh. That's so crazy. <laughs> so like maybe boomers and Gen Zs were feeling like super left out. For sure. Right. They're like, yeah. like who's this person? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But for us, it's like fulfilling all of our ultimate dreams. Right, exactly. <gasps> oh, that's so cool. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right, let's get back to the show. Listeners, as you know, I'm a recovering procrastinator. And because of that, I'm often building ways to getting things done. Inside the annual Manny's Pass, we get to embrace our own unique ways of achieving Together, in our weekly office hours and cafecitos, we'll find strength in our differences, accountability in our goals, and power in our voices as we heal our inner child through coaching and tapping. Your choice. Let's redefine productivity on our terms. Visit cafecompam.com forward slash money's pass and join us. <laughs> bringing it back to your story you make this decision and you're like i need to do something that is actually that not actually but that's making an impact for the greater good of my community and how do you realize that you can actually create a park under someone's name <laughs> oh my gosh i know i had no idea what i was doing um But that was part of it. That was like part of the Oprah mantra, right? Which was just like, okay, I, one step at a time. Who do I know? You know, who can I call? Who's going to teach me about this? What do I Google? How to build a park? You know, how to get a park named after somebody? And it was literally that. And, but I just like stuck with it. I don't know. I had, um, I mean, to be honest, it didn't start out as a, as a park per se. I just knew I wanted the city of Atlanta to honor her and I wanted to walk with her a little bit more. Um, and so I just didn't know what that looked like. And so one of the conversations I had with like, you know, somebody that knew my mom who had some political influence was like, because I was like, well, you know, Jimmy Carter has a whole freeway named after him. So I'd like an interstate named after my mom, you know, yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> building a freeway Taj Mahal to my mother anyway. And so, um, and he was like, you know, that's really hard. Not that I want to discourage you. Not that your mom wasn't awesome, but you know, what about a park? And it was like, before he got to the, I was like, yes, because like, you know what? Like my mother hated driving and freeways are ugly and parks are all about family and parks don't discriminate and parks are nature filled, green, beautiful, happy, Zen places where they should be. And, uh, and then another weird, 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 listen to the signs people. Um, he was like, there are two parks available for renaming in all of Atlanta. One is way out by the airport and one is right here on the corner of, of Coronet way and, and DeFore's which was exactly the part that was across from my parents' sandwich shop and walking distance. Oh my God. Like crazy. And it was dilapidated. I got chills. Yeah, no, it was crazy. And it was, it was totally neglected. You know, it was an, it's, it was a disinvested neighborhood. It was a food desert, you know, it was poor. And the park reflected that, you know, it was a totally neglected park. And I was like, and it, and the good news also, 
is that it was really small. So I felt like I could do this thing. You know, it's just a, a small inner city urban green space that was like half a block or maybe a little bit bigger. And I was like, that's it. And so like, it was crazy. Like it was so crazy. And that's what set me on the path. And then, you know, you gotta, you gotta, I learned all about civic engagement, which I've become like, sort of like a a real proponent of, which is like, it's all about figuring out who your lawmakers are saying, will you write a letter of support? Will you help create this law? I mean, laws had to be changed because up until that point, at least in the state of Georgia, you couldn't rename something until that person, well, unless you were a president, until that person had 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 passed for 50 years. 50? 50. So a law was changed. So I had to like petition to have a law changed. Like I'm telling you, it was like little by little and learning all this stuff. And then, you know, and then you, and then, and then we renamed it. And then it was like, okay, then what are we going to build? Like, is this just going to be another park? Or can this be something that really reflects somebody's spirit? And, uh, and I decided to take the harder path. And I wanted it to reflect her spirit. And I was like, you know, look, like, I wasn't in a rush. I, I also feel like, you know, the, the opportunities that have come to me vis-a-vis this park can't be forced. You know, there can be sort of a vision, but there's a lot of things that I'm like, oh, I really want, you know, a permanent art statue sculpture of something, you know, by some such and such artist. Well, you know what, that door has been shut in my face. I haven't gotten those grants, but I've gotten others and they've helped define the park and help grow the park exactly the way it was the universe was meant to receive it. Um, and so I, that was like sort of, you know, like I always say, I'm like the CEO of this park that doesn't pay me, uh, that doesn't exist like in, in a real formal infrastructure sense because the city of Atlanta actually owns it. Like I'm just a steward of it and a partner to it. I raise money for it um, to to make it as elevated as I can for the community. Uh, you know, we do now, now we have food distributions once or twice a month where we feed 125 to 200 families. We, it's all abilities. Like I, you know, there was barely a playground. Now it's like an all abilities playground with wheelchair access. There's um, a learning nook where p- kids can go and safely read and study that has electricity. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a small learning garden that's Latin ethnobotanical that's dedicated to the first Latino police officer shot and killed in the state of Georgia. So, you know, like it's a small park, but like I say, I like pack it and every aspect of that park fulfills a defining tenant of who my mother was, diversity, community, family, dignity. I love that. And so to give people context, because this wasn't like, you know, you ask some questions and then the next day it happened. And like you said, you were not in a rush. Yeah. It took 10 years. 10 years. And I feel like sometimes we have this project or we see things and we just want to be in a rush. How did you give yourself that space to be like, you know, it's going to happen when it's supposed to and we're taking our own pace and we just have to take that those 15 minutes a day? You know, some days it was easier than others. You know, some days I was like, what am I doing? Is this ever going to happen? And then other days I was like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I just got to like, you know, something's going to happen because I'm just keep, I keep picking up the phone and calling people. I keep sending emails, you know, and little by little, it just grows and builds and snowballs until you've got a park and then you've got attention on the park. And then you've got partners who want to have, food distributions during COVID because people can't go inside and you've earned equity in the neighborhood with the community because people knew who my mother was. So they know this is a safe place. They know that ice isn't going to come after them there, you know, like, and, and you build bonds and, and one thing begets another begets another. But for me, yeah, it took a long time. And, um, and now it's pretty much self-sufficient, you know, and, um, yeah, and I don't have to be there to to turn on the magic. The magic just exists there. Mm. And okay, so we're gonna start fast forwarding to what it is that you do now. So 
we leave co corporate and we're like, you know, we have to transition <laughs> and you did your plan. You started in the nonprofit sector. The park was critical to that. Like, it's weird because I did, like I said, I didn't know what I was like. I know I don't want to be in this path anymore, but I'm trying to get over here on this road. And the park was a mechanism, but I didn't even realize that the park was a mechanism. So when we moved to Memphis, um, well, two things happened. I created the park, but I also it also opened up an opportunity for me to become a presidential leadership scholar. That's a big deal. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a program um, established by like four past presidents. It's bipartisan. And it basically... <laughs> identifies and helps cultivate 60 rising social impact leaders. And I had very little to show except this nascent park, but I had a really big vision for it and, you know, and I could write. And so I, I did a pretty good application, I think. And I got some, um, you know, I, I really worked my, but I, I think that my angels were with me on this. And that program was basically like, you know, a master's dis degree on a on a speed track, right? Like that was that was that was instant networking with a new community that wasn't just media, and it was learning how social impact um, enterprises and ecosystems work. And I was able to create the park um, to its sort of highest level of impact because of the lessons that I was concurrently learning through this program. So when I moved to Memphis and I was like terrified because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually doing this. I'm leaving media. I didn't have a job. I was like, I'm just going to freelance for a year because I know I can write celebrity cover stories. And I did that. And, you know, as you know, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is here. It's, you can literally see it outside my back door. And Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, what is, what is this? And, um, and I, and I happened to get to know some people there. Memphis is a really small town. I'm pretty fearless when just like putting myself in a, in, in the arena. So like, who do I need to meet? Who do I need to introduce myself to? Uh, you know, some fake it till you make it. And, uh, and, in, and, you know, got, to, got a job doing comms communications, which is a, which is a pretty natural pivot. So um, I probably missed you by a year or two when you came, but like, that was part of my job was like finding influencers and folks like you to come and visit and to see the incredible work that that institution does. But, you know, that's where I learned a lot about nonprofits. And then all of a sudden, I got my first nonprofit job. And it's like getting your first job out of college. And then that begets the next begets the next. And now I'm at Mom's Clean Air Force and Eco Madres. Uh, and I couldn't be happier. And it all is circles back to that very first act of activism. When I was a teenager, marching on behalf of the environment and creating a, and creating a green space. So this is like, this feels like home to me. It's a, it's like a new industry and a new beginning, but it's also home. I love that. So when it comes to Eco mm -hmm. what is the, tell us what it is, who is it for? And I have some stats that I'm like, whoa, that I could, that we can discuss. Yeah. No, the stats are terrible. So yeah, I mean, Eco Madres is a program under Moms Clean Air Force, and Moms Clean Air Force is a community of, we are 1.5 million moms and caregivers around the country that are fighting for clean air for our children, for future generations, for the people that we love. Um, and it's been eye opening. You know, this is, I'm stepping into an industry that I didn't really know that much about. And every day I learn a shocking new statistic. And, and for me, um, Eco Madres, which is like our Latino focus program. So, you know, we're trying to deliver information and awareness and advocacy through culturally relevant modalities, you know, whether that's through language or music or meeting people where they are um, to help them realize, okay, um, sorry for you to know this, but like, you know, you probably live within a mile of an oil refinery. If you're Latino in this country, you probably live in a state like California, Texas, or Florida that's seeing, you know, the, the outsized impacts of climate change up close and personal. Latino children, you know, over index in asthma and in asthma deaths. Like yeah. it's, there's just a susceptibility because of the environmental injustice of us being 
mostly fence line and frontline communities, um, that really struck a nerve with me and, you know, made me question about, well, what was the neighborhood that I lived in when I grew up? Um, and made me just want to fight like heck for, for these families. Um, and, and to leverage the power of the democracy that we live in and the civic engagement that we are privileged to be able to use to affect change and policy. Because like just like I started a park, signing petitions in mass and calling legislators in mass actually work. Mm. You shut down factories or you get them to put better equipment on their smokestacks so that it doesn't pollute an entire neighborhood. You can... I always say, like, you can impact change in this country in a way that you can't in other countries. And I and I know that from experience because of Cuba. So, you know, I always say the work that my mom did as an advocate and the work that I do now, you know, is the kind of work that would land you in jail in other countries. For sure. I love that. And there's so much that you shared. And I one of the things that stood up to me, because... San Diego, for example, I live in San Diego. We recently had some flooding. Some flooding. A lot of flooding. So it's a, it's an, it's a disaster. It's been declared a disaster now. Yeah. To your point, the communities that have been affected the most are low-income communities. They are communities of color. I'm on the board of a nonprofit organization and and the Chicano Federation. Shout out to Chicano Federation. Woo-hoo. And they... Um, they have building, low-income housing buildings. Mm-hmm. And... One of the buildings got completely like three feet flooded mm. and all of the first floor, 20 something families, if not more, I don't have the exact number, but they had to evacuate. And it's really unfortunate to see that one, people lost everything and two, they don't know what to do. And so to your, to bring it back to, to what you shared, I think a lot of time, especially people, immigrants, people that don't speak the language, people that don't know how the government works, they don't know that they can go talk to their elected officials. They don't know that there are things that they can like literally raise their hand and be like, we have an issue. And so I know Ecomadres is, is more for like climate, but there's other programs. Is that where like people could get involved, moms and you know, get more action because sometimes it could feel isolating, right? Like just, well, I'm just not going to go by myself to like, right. Some questions. I mean, I do think like we are a great resource. Like if you are in a community that is currently fence line, front line, suffering some impact from poor air quality, um, you know, exposure to toxic chemicals, um, flooding, extreme heat. Um, You know, we have fostered a community of volunteers and organizers that will embrace you and help you navigate the civic engagement that you can deploy in order to get attention. And, you know, and I always say that Um, Because I do think that there's sometimes hesitation in our community um, to stick your neck out because you don't, you kind of want to ride under the radar. And there are protections in place in this country that even if you can't vote, you, you still have a voice in this country and your representatives still represent you. Um, And you can, um, you know, petition for change, you can write op-eds, you can contact uh, the media, you can coalition build. There are things that you can do that are all about movement making that really tip the scales in your favor. And, and it is, a, and it is about finding that community. So you don't feel like a it's overwhelming and B uh, that you're out there alone. Totally. And one other thing to bring it back to, to, to Eco Madres and, and the work. Um, one of the, when I read this, I was like, OMG. More than 75, I think you, I heard you say it in your t- talk, actually. I wrote, I, I'm quoting you. More than 75 people who live in low income communities of color are, are nature deprived and their parks are 50% smaller than white neighborhoods. This is like 
I typed that really fast as I was hearing you. So. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, and that's and that's why we do the work that we do because that that inequity is, um, to me, oh, horrible and self perpetuating. And if you don't change it, it doesn't get better. And sometimes you're the only person that's in a position to make that change um, and to be the voice. So. <sighs> And like that, there are so many other statistics, right, that are just, um, you know, 80% of farm workers identify as Latino, right? And, and who's suffering the brunt of, of extreme heat? But, you know, my m- grandmother, when she came from Cuba in the 70s, because she came much later, you know, she worked on a radish farm in Belle Glade, Florida. And that was hard enough then. I can't imagine what it would be like now, you know? Yeah. And... And so I just have such a, such a desire to rectify those injustices. And I, and for me, a lot of it comes back to dignity and, um, and equity, frankly, and, and wanting to make sure that the privileges that are afforded other people, um, aren't withheld from other communities just because of a zip code. You know, I talk a lot about, um, Um, experiential symmetry and this concept of like things that are native to nice communities, um, artwork, big parks, soccer fields are not native to disinvested communities. And that's why my park has a soccer field. You know, that's why we have a water fountain that works. Yes. The fact that you don't have the economic wherewithal to live in a better quote unquote community further away from big polluters doesn't mean that you don't deserve to have justice in every breath. So, I mean, that's really what, what drives me and the whole team to make sure that those voices are represented because those voices, unfortunately are the ones that are suffering the most and getting and getting the least amount of information and help. Exactly. 100%. That's where I was going to go. Because I think what I love is that Eco Madres has the all the content in English and Spanish. Mm-hmm. And so there's accessibility because I used to, one of my lives, many lives ago, I used to be a, a migrant recruiter. That was the title. So basically what I would do is go into families' homes and ask them about their, this is when I was in college, I'm sorry. And talk to them about their kids and, you know, like education. Are they taking them to all the resources that are available? Because many times these are migrant workers that literally just come to work in the fields and they go home and they don't know what they don't know. And so looking at the content from Eco Madre, from Eco Madres, I, I really appreciated that it's in both languages and that there's this effort to, to bring people in the conversation and, provide the space for them to step into it as well. Because like thinking about the people that get affected the most, they don't know what they don't know. You know, they, a lot of times, like for example, in San Diego, the people that evacuated the building, they're refugees, you know, they, they barely got here. And so having groups like this, that not only provide the space, the voice, the advocacy, the, the, the solidarity from other people, it's really powerful. So thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. And I stand with you too. So thank you for giving us voice and to be able to share this resource and this community with other people. Cause you know, we want to make sure that the community knows that we exist. And when they have an issue as it relates to their health and climate, that we are there for them. Totally. So tell us all the places and spaces where we can find you. Well, Certainly, momscleanairforce.org. Um, we have an entire dedicated microsite there for Eco Madres where you can learn all about us. And we even have a band called Eco Musica. Well, they're called Son Tierra, um, where we, they, they, they're classically trained Latino musicians who create their own songs about climate and climate issues. And, um, and they perform around the country at our community events as a way, again, of, of reaching our community through through trusted modalities. And then, um, you know, follow us, Eco Madres, 
and Moms Clean Air Force on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. We're in all the places. Um, and uh, looking forward to having um, hopefully our first big conference at the end of the year. So more to come on that. I'll have to let you know and invite you. Um, just, you know, look, this issue isn't going away anytime soon. The climate situation is scary and dangerous. And um, and it will continue to impact our communities disproportionately. And environmental ju- injustice is sort of, um, is, is so institutionalized uh, that it's going to take years to disentangle ourselves from it. So we're in it for the long fight. For sure. Well, thank you so much for your work and for all the things. Last few questions. Do you have a remedio that you want to share with us? <laughs> I thought about you asked all those really cool questions. So I have this little trick that I just wanted to share with your community in case it helps. Um, because, you know, I don't use VIX. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I think like I actually have like a, 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 like a terrible reaction to it for, I mean, I can smell it in my nose right now, even as I say it, you know, just thinking about it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's so interesting. You're the first one. <laughs> I'm like, get that away from me. It doesn't work. I mean, I want to believe it works, but it doesn't work. Or it just makes that's me so nauseous funny. now. <laughs> uh, brings back bad memories. Um, so I don't, but, but one of your other really important questions, I think was something about like, you know, what's a ritual or what's something that you do to sort of ground yourself. And some people have what they call um, sort of a a funeral philosophy, which you may have heard of, which is basically you write your obituary, which is a Mm -hmm. kind of morbid approach, I think, but it works, right? It's like, it's like anchors you and what do you want to be remembered for? You know, do you want to be remembered for how many shoes you owned? Or do you want to be remembered for standing up for others? who didn't or couldn't stand up for themselves. Um, So I sort of reframe that. And I actually learned this through the presidential leadership scholars and, and, and the exercise is to write a fairy tale and it starts once upon a time. Yeah. And so you write this whole fairy tale and it's like, and you can probably Google it and find like the template. And it's like once upon it here, I'm going to find it so I can read it to you (laughs) because I keep it in front of me all the time. I love that. Yeah. And this is what I call like my manifestation without pressure. You asked me earlier on, like, how do you, how do you, how do you endure? How do you sustain? And like, and I can't lay claim to that concept of manifestation without pressure, but it's this idea of like, you just envision it. It's sort of like a vision board, right? And you work toward it, but you also accept that sometimes you're going to go left shift or right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So once upon a time, there was an underserved um, Hispanic community in Atlanta that did not have a part to play in um, and to connect with each other culturally. Every day, hundreds of children had to go elsewhere, far away, nowhere at all to play and connect socially. But one day, a Latina, inspired by the legacy of her mother and her heritage, created a park for them to play in. Because of that, the Hispanic community now has a park to culturally connect and to play in while honoring their heritage. And because of that, the larger community in Atlanta is able to celebrate and connect with this community until the, finally the park was so popular that it was recognized nationally and received many awards. Um, and ever since then has been a model for building parks rooted in equity and inclusion in communities that need parks. <laughs> wow. I love that. Not, 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 not like the most elegantly written, but, and you can see like my little scrappy piece of paper, but like, this is like once upon a time, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and I'm still working towards it. Like I haven't even gotten to all my goals. Like, I don't know if this park is a template for other parks, but I do know that it exists now. So not only can people in Atlanta see the first park ever named for a Latino um, and those that don't know who my mother was, will see Gonzalez with an accent over an A and say, that's a Latino Mm -hmm. name. Uh, They belong there. They take up space. Um, And I hope that inspires, if not people to do the same in their own communities, uh, but to at least know that they are seen. 
For sure. Oh my gosh, so good. We can just oh. close it there. Okay. <laughs> You're amazing. This was a beautiful interview. I love what you're doing to uplift voices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming along. Stay shiny. All right, listeners, that was my conversation with Isabel. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope you are so inspired. After I talked to Isabel, I was like, oh my gosh, what can I do to improve my neighborhood, my community, to get involved? Because there's many ways that we can we can take action and making changes. My hope is that you can pull from Isabel's story and and take a little bit and implement something in your life that can leave the world a better place. Because of course your existence already does. And so taking action and making changes is important. Iwana listeners, thank you so much for being here. 350 episodes. OMG. It's amazing. I'm so grateful. We are still here. It's I really don't take you for granted. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure that you do follow the podcast because Apple released an update and it basically dropped like three fourths of downloads. And so as we continue to to fund this indie podcast, we are currently not part of any type of network or organization. We're fully self-funded and of course, we are looking to engage brands and get sponsorships and find ways to monetize the production of the show because it does cost money to to create, host, produce, edit, etc. I do ask if you are in whichever platform actually to follow and subscribe because that allows the numbers to look better. I know you're listening and you know, we need to have evidence because numbers is what, it's how we can show credibility. And on that note, also what shows credibility is your reviews. So please, if you feel called to drop some words, leave us a review, leave your thoughts, you can do so in a review type format. You can also drop stars, whichever platform you listen on, you know, just hit the the five stars ideally and that also supports the show in, in a very free, literally takes two seconds way. And I don't typically ask you for a lot. You know, if you're on YouTube, hello. We are newly on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you're notified when a new episode drops and, you know, tune in to all the things. I would love to stay connected. We can connect on social media at Capicompan Podcast. We can stay connected. Just follow the podcast in whatever platform of choice you you use. You can also check out all the episode notes with all the links that we talked about, capicompan.com. That's where you can also learn about my work and hanging out together. I literally just finished hosting office hours for the Money's Pass and it's incredible the transformations that we are witnessing just from people showing up. You know, sometimes all you have to do is show up for yourself. And so if you're looking for a place where you can feel supported in whichever way, think about joining the Money's Pass because it's it's a co-created space. I didn't make this happen. This is co-created from all the people that have chosen to join us. And some of my niece have been there for years. And I'm so grateful for every single one of you, even the ones that have left, because this space has been co-created by every single one of you. So if you want to be a part of it, you can check it out. Cafecompam.com forward slash money's pass. It's how we can work together. Tap about it and get in touch with our core self and do some inner child work and, you know, take action for us. Talk about Calladita culture. <laughs> All the things. Y bueno, listeners, thank you so much for being here. Como siempre, stay shining. Sabrosura, pa ti que que.